Tales from the Wild. Stories from the Heart. A journey into the mind and soul of fired up business professionals where they share their vision for the future. And hear from a different non profit organization every month as they create awareness of their goals and their needs. Dive into a world of untamed passion as we join our host, Shireen Buerta, for this month's episode of Friends from Wild Places. Hi, good day, everybody. Good day, Hoi Dark Professionals. Shireen here. I'm your virtual bookkeeper and QuickBooks advisor from Shireen's Bookkeeping Services. I have tax, sales tax on the brain, guys. Don't be part of the statistics of businesses that incorrectly pay their sales tax. Your agency, your frequency, your products and services, and your customer location are all factors that are considered for the collection of sales tax. As your bookkeeper, I'll make sure you are paying the right amounts of sales tax and at the right frequency and keep up with the always changing sales tax rates using the QuickBooks Sales Tax Center. As a QuickBooks advisor, automated sales tax calculations are extremely helpful if you know what you're doing and all the information is entered correctly. If you want to know more, go check me out at www.shereensbookkeeping.com and allow me to keep your books clean. All right, welcome back, everyone. My name is Shireen, your host for the day, and you are listening to Friends from Wild Places. I'm super excited to introduce my co-hosts to you today. First up is Professor Tanya Skoses. She's been on the show before, guys. I know you recognize that name, um, but I'm super excited to have her back on. But this time we're going to go more into her career in senior placement specialist. So I'm super excited to hear more about that. She is situated in Florida, United States. Welcome, Tanya, to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shireen. That's awesome to have you here. My other co-host is Frank Agen, founder of Am Spirits and author of Foundational Networking, as well as The Champion. He's situated in Ohio, United States. Very warm welcome to you, Frank. Thanks for joining us today. I need a warm welcome. It's 40 degrees here. So thank you. That's Fahrenheit. Right. You can have some of my warmth. It's 40 degrees, close to 40 degrees Celsius here in South Africa. But yes, it is so good to have you both on the show. And um, let's get straight into it. So how I met Tanya is through BNI and... Tanya introduced me to Frank. So that's just a testament of how awesome networking groups are for you as an entrepreneur and a business owner. So we'll get further into that. But Tanya, if I may ask you, what is one of the biggest takeaways that you took from BNI? Um, Definitely relationship building, people that you meet, the networking and um that's it's phenomenal it's just the uh, and i my word of the year is globalization networking so um i've met uh you know both frank and you different places all through networking all through the linkedin platform and uh, it's really really amazing right right thank you for sharing that and that is so true um so we have spoken about bni quite often and if you are a business owner or entrepreneur that's looking to join a networking group, you are more than welcome to come and visit our, well, my networking chapter, High Performance Referrals. We meet every Tuesday on Zoom at 7 a.m. PST time. That's every Tuesday on Zoom at 7 a.m. PST time. And if you want to register yourself to come and visit, you can either email me at shireen at shereensbookkeeping.com or I will leave the website for our chapter where you can register yourself. So if you are trying to find the perfect team for you, you're more than welcome to visit my team. But we've also got Frank here today who is founder of Amspirit, which is another 
business networking business. So you have options. And um, I encourage you to look around and find the team that best suits you, your personality, and your business. So I'm super excited. Talking about Frank, Frank, please tell us where you're from and a little bit about who you are. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly how much you want, but I, I was born in Chicago, um, and uh, then we moved to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, which is about as far north in Michigan as you can go. Actually, Tanya and I technically would live on the same street because US 41 ends in Miami and starts just north of where I grew up. It's uh, um, we get about 300 inches of snow up there. Um, so it's, it's, it's snow country. Anyhow, you guys don't get that, but that's fine. Um, I love that. <laughs> hand. Frank, do the hand. All the Michigan people, don't they do the hand? Well, they, they do, right? But I'm in the Upper Peninsula, so it's up here in the Upper Peninsula. So it's, it's I kind of have to do that, right? So it's way, way up there. When I get to the bridge, I still have five-hour drive to get home. But at any rate, um, wow. I went to college in Wisconsin, which is just uh, south of there, and then uh, ended up going to law school at the Ohio State University, which is one of the larger uh, research universities in the country. And uh, got a law degree, got an MBA, and started my career in public accounting. Um, and I was a tax consultant, which was a great job. It was a great pay. Um, I just don't want to do taxes for the rest of my life. And then that led me into being an attorney. And uh, um, then that ultimately led me into essentially getting into a networking group. Um, and then I bought that networking group back in the early 2000s and rebranded it as Amspirit Business Connections. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That is so awesome. Um, thank you for sharing a little bit about yourself, Frank. It's it's really important to have a little bit of a background of who we're talking to. So thank you for sharing that. Um, last week, we had a little bit of a topic of how to prioritize your life by putting the most important things at the top and not falling into the, the curse of busyness and having a very busy life, not very productive. So uh, we won't talk much on that this week, but I do want to just share a quote with you guys. It's, I learned that beliefs are just repeated thoughts. If you want to believe something new, you just have to repeat a new thought. Singing helps you naturally repeat the thought we want to believe. And that was from Neil Samudra. Did you know the results of a 2020 study suggested people typically have more than 6,000 thoughts a day? So on that, Frank, what are you singing about? What am I singing about? Like, what's my favorite song kind of a thing? No, more like what What are the thoughts that you constantly repeat in inside of your head? And, and oh, what, yeah. what are the ways where you get, you know, reinforce the, the positive thoughts and not the negative? Yeah, yeah. you know, um, it's interesting. My, uh, I had a conversation with my daughter when she was still in high school. And um, there's a... She kept me waiting at a track meet. It was freezing out, right? It was like 30 degrees and we're freezing. I want to go home. She's standing out there with her coach. And I'm just trying to be patient because it's her time. And she uh, she came to me, got in the car. And I said, geez, what are you guys talking about? I mean, it's the track meet's over. And so, well, we were just sharing. Um, we were just sharing life philosophies. And, she, and I said, OK, that's interesting. What's yours? You know, she's a 17 year old girl. What's your life philosophy? And uh, she said. She said, I didn't make this up, but I saw it online and I've kind of adopted it. But she said, my first thought, uh, our first thought makes us human. But our second thought serves to define us. And she went on to explain that, you know, when you when you have that first thought, um, it's usually a reaction. For example, this isn't her example. It's my example. You're in traffic and somebody flips you off. Right. Or somebody yells an expletive at you. Your first reaction is anger. And that's perfectly natural. But what's your second reaction? That's what defines you. That's what determines who you are. 
Um, and so what I find myself doing a lot throughout the day is just ha I do have those first thoughts. We all have those first, first thoughts. People bark at us, people, whatever. Um, I like to take a deep breath and just say, okay, what does that really mean? Is that really a threat? Because a lot of times that's why we get angry because, you know, we feel threatened. Um, and just, yeah, you know, so I guess my thoughts really stem around being patient and trying to understand other people. Yes, absolutely. That, that's a very good one. Um, and that further with that is, you know, you don't know where, where people have come from in the sense of what they've experienced, what they're going through. They might be going through something um, far beyond anything that you can relate to. And, you know, sometimes sharing a little bit of kindness towards that person um, it will go a long way. And not to mention you can control you can control your reaction. You can't control anyone else's reaction to the situation or to you. So, yeah, I agree with that. You you have a choice. Everything has a choice. So, yep. and what about yourself, Tanya? What are you singing about? I am singing. <clears throat> my verb, as I like to say, is inspire. So I just kind of go through my day, my week, my month, my year, inspiring people in whatever capacity I can do it, whether it's a conversation, whether it's someone in the grocery line, if I can inspire somebody that is singing my tune. And I don't sing, by the way, I could clear out a crowd if I actually tried. So we're, we won't go on that topic. But my, my verb is inspire. And I, I truly lead by example with that. Right. And by doing that, you know, Tanya, that's another way of, of allowing the positive thoughts to win in your brain. Uh, you're thinking, as, as I just said, over 6,000 thoughts a day, not all of them are positive about yourself, you know, ideologies about yourself. And to, to reinforce the positive side instead of the negative side, one of the things that, that helps is doing good things for others inspiring others and that just helps you keep on the, the good side um for me affirmations got to keep on repeating the positive things and that's why when they say you know singing when you're singing something you're very much repeating something over and over again so you in the same way, affirmations, you need to repeat them over and over again just to reinforce that positive side um, and not fall into that dark side of the negativity. So thank you for sharing, Tanya. I really appreciate it. Now that we're busy talking to you, Tanya, I'd really like you just to tell us a little bit of how you got into senior becoming a senior placement specialist. So that was uh, completely unexpected. Uh, my dad was diagnosed with a Lewy body dementia two years ago, actually two years ago. And um, I knew of the word. I didn't really know anything about it. I didn't have any personal stories with it or anyone that I could actually relate to. So when my dad was diagnosed, it was um, just kind of diving into the the journey um, of navigating the system, of understanding it, of understanding the progression of the disease. And I'm a good networker. Um, I mean, I'm very well connected. I have a, I know a lot of people and I kept hitting brick wall after brick wall after brick wall. And for me, it was just like, how can this be possible? Like, I mean, I've contacted um, you know, resources, people. Um, then I, I got introduced to this word placement agencies. Well, I started with one and two, and some I even paid. They did absolutely nothing. Um, others just talked, said, we can't help you. And I finally landed upon <laughs> a great, great guy, Arnie Cowan. And one conversation with Arnie on a Friday night at six o'clock, and he said, I can help you. And I'm like, wow. Like, I felt literally like the skies just opened. And I was like wow, like you can help me out of, out of, you know, six, seven, eight placement agencies. I believe he was number seven and he helped me. He, he helped me. And within two hours, he had my, we found my place, uh, a place for my dad. Um, I relocated my dad from the West coast of Florida to Miami and 
Arnie was just a blessing, like just a true, true gift. And I started um, referring people to Arnie and, uh, you know, people would come my way and, you know, because of my dad's diagnosis, people would kind of reach out, like if they had a similar situation, maybe their mom, dad, wife, husband, someone. And before you knew it, um, Arnie and I just had a conversation and he's like, Tanya, why don't you just come work for me? And I'm like, well, I have a full-time job. I'm a full-time professor. Um, I do expert witness on the side. I said, uh, I'm going to take on senior placement. And he's like, well, you're already sending people my way and you know the system. Why don't you have your own territory? So for me, I truly call it my blessed work. It is truly a gift to be able to help people in crisis like myself. And um, even just having the conversation with somebody, just explaining things that I wish I knew in my situation. So that's how I started with my, uh, as I call it, my blessed work. That's awesome, Tanya. And tell me, what does your job entail day to day? So what are the different things that you do? So a placement agency, um, we place for Florida. So we are, so I'm a senior placement specialist in Florida and I cover the uh, West and East coasts. So Frank, unlike the Michigan, we go like this with the diving board. I think it's the opposite, right? So, so East to West coast of Florida. And um, basically if you think of us like a matchmaker or Cupid, okay. So we match people AKA families, it can be um, somebody that can no longer live alone due to a diagnosis of one of the dementias. And Alzheimer's is the most popular one of the dementias. So Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. So it's the umbrella term is dementia. And then you have all the different types, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, all the different types, including Alzheimer's. So when, what, what I, my role is actually matching people And a lot of times it's not the person themselves because the person can no longer make cognitive decisions. So it's the family making the decision for their loved one, finding them the right community. And I would love to, I'm looking to actually change this verbiage on the state level. So I've already had one conversation. Um, I'm looking to change. I don't like the word facility. I mean, because when we, you know, find a community for somebody to thrive in, that usually becomes their permanent home. Hmm. for for the rest of their life. So when I think of, you know, finding the right community, finding the right environment, um, not all places are the same. There's, you know, smaller communities, larger communities, some have um, more activities, um, less activities, some are more um, center-based. So there's many different, it's almost like picking a hotel or a restaurant, you have choices. And it doesn't mean that one is good or bad. It's just, you know, it's just a different flair or a different feel. So I am like the matchmaker between families and the community. So what I do is I take out just getting handed a book this thick from the hospital with my, when my dad was being discharged to say, here, go find yourself a place for your loved one. So we break it down. So we we kind of, we usually, what we do is present three to five communities for the family that can look at based on what a their budget, because there is a cost. So based on finances, location, what type of um, community they're looking for. And um, so that's what we do. We are free. There's no cost to us. We get paid directly by the community and we vet our communities to know that it's a good place, <clears throat> what kind of activities, what kind of food, what kind of outings. Some, some of them do bus trips, um, you know, trips to the museum. Um, a lot has been evolving since um, since COVID, especially things, you know, kind of go, getting, I don't want to say back to normal, but the new normal or the new vision, um, you know, for us. So that that is what we do. And um, it's truly, it's just, there's no words that can describe it because when we make a match and the family's happy, they feel like it's such a relief and their loved one, the primary, you know, I love Maslow's hierarchy. It's it basically the person is safe, being taken care of and able to be independent. So that's what we do. We do place for independent living for people who just want more of a community. We place for assisted living, which is just people who need more assistance with, they call like adult daily living activities, such as bathing, showering, grooming, eating, um, metal, you know, medication management. And we also do memory care. That's awesome. I love that, you know, the, the focus that I'm hearing here is that not every shoe fits every different type of foot. You are really customizing each person 
finding the perfect spot that suits them. And I think um, we're still stuck, well, you know, South Africa is still stuck with, oh, you've got Alzheimer's, then you go to this home here. Oh, you've got that disease, you go to that home there. You know what I mean? And they don't really go specifically customizing um, to the right person for the right home and for what their needs are. So that's awesome to hear, Sonia. Thank you for for just uh, you know broadening our minds when it comes to senior placement. And here's my next question. When it comes to Alzheimer's, do you have some more facts or knowledge about Alzheimer's just to educate us a little bit more about it? So um, I'll speak more generally just to the dementias. I am certified by the Alzheimer's Association as a community educator. So I do do presentations to groups, assisted living communities. One thing that I think in the United States specifically, there's not enough awareness. It's kind of similar to you know South Africa from my understanding from what you're describing. And in the United States, it's like when people start quote unquote acting different, um, you know, just like, you know, for example, they, people may start repeating themselves or asking um, a question that is kind of common knowledge. So, you know, in the community, what happens is people start looking at these people like, wow, that's something wrong with that person or something is off. And it becomes stigmatized. Like, you know, to say your loved one has cancer is different than saying your loved one has dementia. And because there's not enough known about it. So one takeaway that I had, it's a progressive disease. So it is a disease. It's a disease of the brain. That's what dementia is. Um, and basically what happens is it, the executive functioning is one that, you know, reasoning, um, being able to think and communicate slowly or, or quickly, depending, you know, and my, one of my favorite things that I've learned is they say, if you know somebody with dementia, you know somebody with dementia. You don't know everybody with dementia because it's so different for so many different people. So everyone could have somebody with dementia and it progress and it progresses and it looks differently. So the statistic is it is a disease. There is, you know, a lot of being um, you know, new information, new medication, new treatments, new trials. Um, one area that I think is really, really lacking, and this is my area of expertise as a funeral director, is um, donation, like um, body donation, organ donation at the time of one's passing to further the research. So that's one area that I love really talking to folks about as far as understanding options. So a lot of states in the United States specifically have their own programs for that um, organ donation. But I think it's just a conversation that so many people don't know about. Um, so, as, and as far as um, Shireen to answer, you know, as far as any statistics, um, you know, it's unfortunately, um, the statistics, you know, are quite alarming as far as having, you know, the, the number of people. And then we also have a lot of people not diagnosed, you know, that don't have access to being, you know, dose, diagnosed properly. Um, for example, my father's diagnosis of Lewy body is one of the rarer forms of dementia. And what I found fascinating was with that specific diagnosis, people present with hallucinations. So if a physician or neurologist is not trained in Lewy body and they give someone an anti-hallucination or anti-hallucinogenic medication in somebody with Lewy body dementia, it actually increases their hallucinations. So that to me is like a wow, because I'm like, and that's what happened to my dad. I mean, so the hallucinations got worse and worse and worse. Finally, you find the right person, the key person that can actually diagnose someone. So I think there's just so much unknown. And, you know, just because somebody is credentialed or holds an initial after their name doesn't mean it's the right fit for, for your person. Just like you mentioned, Shireen, just because the community may not be the right fit. Mm -hmm. And I think in the United States, what happens is, if folks and people in the community are not aware of placement agencies like Sunshine Senior Placement, what happens is they have their loved one ending up in a quote unquote skilled nursing facility, also known as a SNF or a nursing home. And nursing homes are great for people who need the level of care, who need full assist. People with dementia, usually unless they're late stage, 
They can walk, they can talk, they can function, they just wander. So to keep them safe, they don't need a nursing home. They need a place that they can walk and feel as free to live out their independence to the best that they can. Right, right. Yeah, that makes total sense, Tanya. Um, and I 100% agree with you when it comes to that. And I, I, you make me my heart so happy just listening to you. And I hope that that spreads worldwide. Um, and so this question goes for the both of you. What is one of the greatest challenges you have faced and the lesson you've learned from that? Frank, you go ahead. Greatest challenge. Depends on the day, I guess. Um, you know, for me, well, again, it, it, you know, greatest challenge for me um, goes back to the word I used before, patience. Um, you know, it's, it, it's easy to envision where you want to be. It's easy to envision where you want people to be. It's easy to envision all sorts of things. Um, but making it happen is difficult. And it's not going to unfold the way you think it should unfold. It's not going to unfold on the timeline you think it should unfold. You may end up somewhere totally different. I'm not saying bad, but somewhere different. Um, and you just have to be willing to kind of accept that. And it's, you know, when we're young, you know, when we're young, when we're in school, our our visions are very our aspirations are very controlled, right? I want to be on the Dean's list or I want to do this. I want to get this degree. And it's very controlled. It's almost like, it's almost like a train, you know, trains on tracks and the tra a train's going to go exactly where it's headed because it's on those tracks yeah. and it's very guided. Um, but with respect to, as you get older and get out into the world, and as I listen to Tanya talk, I mean, she, Talked to her three years ago, she never would have envisioned that she's a senior placement person, right? Um, and it's just, you know, she's like driving on a six lane highway and there's lots of different directions that she can go and lots of off ramps and different things like that. And so that's what I've had to learn is, is that yes, you know, I can have a vision, but that's gonna change. And the timeline to get there is just, I've just gotta be patient. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. What about yourself, Tanya? What has been one of your biggest challenges and the lesson you've learned from it as an entrepreneur and a business owner? And I'm taking all sorts of notes here. I feel like this is an intervention. I've got. If you know someone with dementia, <laughs> you only know someone with dementia. You don't know everyone with dementia. Uh, Tanya knows this, but my father's battling something similar. Um, so Tanya, I've had a lot of conversations. So I find this very find this very interesting so yeah. thank you right it's my it's truly my uh, inspiration and, and truly my gift uh, for whatever I can help people with or at least inspire them to you know maybe research something a little bit further or investigate so um great question Shireen for me I I've adopted the motto that the journey is the destination and the reason I say that is so many times, like Frank mentioned, you know, maybe when we're younger, maybe it's, you know, to finish school or maybe it's to get married or to have kids or, or whatever the goal is at that time period. And sometimes if people don't meet the goal or whatever we in the United States, we say the American dream, right? So like to live the American dream, what, by what definition, by, you know, getting married, by having kids, by having successful, you have one house, two houses, you got one car, one boat, and then you start getting more and more. And there's no nothing wrong with that there's I mean I have friends that um you know that do that and, and it's great um I at one time was that person and I found over the time simplifying just being able to simplify so you know a couple of times I had the big homes had the you know big garages and you know big yards and and everything and now I'm in a small apartment right outside of Miami and I couldn't be happier and I say to myself and I think Frank and Shireen both I may have had this conversation with you I truly believe if somebody gave me the keys to a house 
right now and said, just live in it and upkeep it, I wouldn't want it. It's, I truly feel like just to break free from the stigma of society has been a challenge because we feel like we can't break down the barriers because of the boxes. So for example, myself being raised, you know, Italian, there's a certain stereotypes amongst Italians, um, you know, other, you know, people maybe of religious groups. So I think, you know, just kind of breaking out of the cultural norms has been, it's been a challenge, but it's been a gift because it's freeing. So when I can sit here and look you both through the Zoom box in, in your eyes and say, you know what, like I am happy and my, my, I feel like, again, you know, the journey is the destination as opposed to having an end goal. And, you know, as you know, even as a professor with my students, my goal is to have them be proud of who they are and the adversities they overcome. Because so many times in the beginning of the semester, I'll hear, well, I wish I had done this earlier. You know, I'm 40 and I'm starting school. I'm 60 and I'm starting school. And we truly all are evolving. So it doesn't matter when you decide to take the whatever you want to take, whether it's to go back to school, whether it's to learn a new skill, whether it's to learn a new language, whether it's to take up pottery, I mean, whatever the passion is, but we all sit back and put our own limitations. I'm too old, I'm not good enough, I don't have the money. And one of the biggest, it's not a challenge, Shireen, but I would say is not to chase a dollar. I left huge amount of money in, in a job change that I took huge. Most people would probably like, look at me, say like, <laughs> you're insane. Like, you know, this is just not normal. And I've learned, you know, what? I don't want to chase a dollar. I don't want to be stuck because of a dollar figure. So I feel like by my motto of inspiring people, which I believe is a gift through my blessed work is through Sunshine Senior Placement. I feel that I can live um, you know, and inspire others and do good, be a good human, and really not to be under the constraints of normal, quote unquote, societal, cultural adversities and norms that people may experience. Right. Thank you, Tanya. Um, and this is why we are friends. You and I have become very close because you are an inspiration. And I love every moment chatting to you. So thank you for all you do. In likewise, everything. likewise. <laughs> Not just in your scene of placement, but for your students um, and for your funeral directing and your educating. And, and it's just fantastic. So just stay the way you are and keep on doing what you're doing. It's fantastic. So, Mr. Frank Agen, please, moving on to you, I'd love you just to tell us why you chose to start your own networking business. Um, well, I kind of got into the story a little bit, um, but, you know, I, I had this, I had this, you know, this kind of gets tight, you know, all these things are all tied in together as Tanya's talking, I'm thinking, you know, different things and people going back to school is really a healthy thing because it keeps their brain healthy. And, and that's, they're finding that's something that can, uh, ward off dementia, uh, in certain cases, but at any rate, um, you know, she talks about, you know, the trappings of life. And, you know, so I graduate law school and I've got this business degree and I'm just thinking, OK, you know, work for this big firm. Lots of money, great prestige, you know, office, glass windows, all of this stuff. And you realize at some point that that doesn't make you happy. And uh, so that's why I decided to leave the firm and go into private practice. And my wife tells me, she said, if you'd have stayed at that firm, we'd probably do, be divorced because I just, when you're not happy, the people around you are not happy. Mm -hmm. And um, so I left, I left the firm to go into private practice. I'm very entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial. I've always been very entrepreneurial. Um, and I tell people that a funny thing happened to me when I went into private practice. And the funny thing was that nothing happened. I had no idea how to get clients. Uh, this is 1995. There's not an internet. There's not, you know, who do you talk to? You know, the whole notion of now, yeah, there are books out there, but how do you find out about the books? You know, so I struggled and I had a conversation one day. When I say I struggled, I'd go to networking events and I, I would be that jerk just handing out my card to everybody thinking this was going to work. Um, 
And I didn't know any different. It didn't feel right, but I didn't know any different. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had lunch one day with a friend of mine who took a different path out of law school and she started her own firm. So she was six, seven years into having her, her own mm -hmm. firm. And I asked her, I said, what do I need to do to become successful? Mm -hmm. And she said, amongst other things, she said, you need to get into a tips club or a leads group. Well, I really had no idea what she was talking about. Um, <clears throat> but I was quasi desperate. So through a series of introductions, got invited to a meeting of a, a, an organization that brought people together every week to learn about each other and exchange referrals. It wasn't BNI. It was an organization based out of Pittsburgh. It was founded by a woman who knew Ivan Meisner, um, and they had a similar past. Um, they were, I think they were both on the tip for like a New York minute. Um, but at any rate, as it was explained to me, um, it made total sense that I could lift up my whole world by helping other people become successful. So I really got involved in that organization. I became the, my chapter's first president. I did that for a couple of years. And then shortly after serving my time as president, um, there was something happening in the local market. And um, I had an opportunity to become the first franchisee. And it was a smaller market for the organization. But when I took over, I just brought a different mindset to things. The guy who was running the market before the Columbus market, he really was looking at the organization, his position as a way to grow his consulting business. And my, my focus was, I want to grow this market. I want to grow this business. And so I got really involved, um, became very inventive with respect to how we serve members. Um, and then at one point, and this is this is the early 2000s, had an opportunity to buy the whole organization, or at least buy my territories. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it had grown to being bigger than half the whole organization anyway. So it was just the woman who owned it, she was looking to downsize, and it just it just made sense. Um, so I did. So, you know, I, when people people call me the founder, and you know, it's just easier to say that, but in reality, I bought something that was already existing. And I did it because, you know, much as Tanya has said, I, I want to help people. I want to help people become successful. People leave corporate America. People go into business every day. And a lot of, without help, they fail. And I'm not saying it's got to be BNI or it's got to be Amspirit or got to be anything, but it's all about relationships and we need to help other people. And this is really kind of put me in a position to, to help people. So that's how I got into it. And it, you know, really has changed the trajectory of my life uh, mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, to be able to serve the small business community this way. That's awesome. Sure. That is amazing. So Frank, are you a host to any podcast yourself? I have, uh, I, I am. Yes. I have uh, a podcast. It's called uh, networking RX. And I just recorded my 555th episode. Um, I know it's pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> it just creeps up on you. You know, you start it and you're like, oh, okay, you know, I wonder how I wonder how long this will last. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, there's there's no end in sight. There's always just great people to talk to and great things to talk about with respect to professional relationships and networking. <laughs> um, but it comes out uh, at least once a week, sometimes three or four times a week, depending upon how, you know, the guests and things that are I have to say. So, yeah. That's awesome. Talking about podcasts, Buzzsprout is hands down the easiest and best way to launch, promote, and track your podcast. Your show can be online and listed in all major podcast directories like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more within minutes of finishing your recording. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know we send you and helps support the show. So Frank, can you tell us a little bit more about AMSPIRT and what they stand for? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. You know, one of the questions I get all the time is, well, what makes you different? Right. I talk to a lot of BNI people. And, um, you, you know, when I talk to people, I, you know, I use BNI as a way of explaining, hey, are you familiar with BNI? Yeah, we're essentially a competitor. Um, we do things very, you know, we're very similar. And I, I, I don't use competitor in the, the combative sense, but it's just that's how I, it's easy to define it. You know, people get it. Um, and then eventually the question becomes, well, how are you different? And the answer I have is, I really don't know. I mean, I've been to BNI meetings. Tanya's had me at her meeting, and and I've been to one or two others, but I've never been in BNI. So it's not fair for me to compare my organization to BNI on a one-time visit. Mm -hmm. um, and so I tell people, it's like I'm not really about comparisons because those are never fair. Um, and somebody's it, it just it's not a productive thing. But what I like to talk about is I like to talk about the things that we are focused on and what we have found, what I've what I've learned long ago is that people come to this organization for one reason and one reason only, and it's referrals. And people leave this organization for one reason and one reason only, and it's probably lack of referrals. And what I've, what I've come to realize is that there are three reasons why people don't get referrals. And only three reasons. I have people coming to me all the time. I'm not getting referrals or they're upset or whatever. You know what? And we just start talking about it. And it's always one of these three reasons. One, they don't have enough of a relationship. Or maybe they have a bad relationship, right? Somebody joins your or somebody just joins your chapter. They're not going to get flooded with referrals because you don't know them. You know, you're not going to you need to get a chance to know them um, or somebody's in your chapter and you might not like them. Or you might not trust them. And those people are out there. There are there are wonderful people out there that we know and like that just don't do good work. And so you're not going to refer them. So that's the first reason is people need to work on that relationship and have that relationship. Yeah. The second reason why people don't get referrals is they do a poor job of helping people recognize opportunities. I might think they're the greatest person in the world and sit next to somebody at an event, basketball game, whatever it is, who's a perfect client for them and not make the referral because I don't recognize the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And we're all we're all we're all victims of that. We're all guilty of that. I know I am as an attorney. I just assumed everybody knew what I did. Right. Um, and so, you know, just trying to help people understand those things. And the third reason why people don't get referrals is people might like them, trust them, and might recognize opportunities for them, but not be comfortable talking about it. Now, Tanya is a great example. I have no doubt that people think Tanya is the bomb. She's great, right? And she probably does a really good job of educating people on what to recognize. When you see this, think of me, it could be a good referral for me. Yeah. Where they where they might struggle is, geez, yeah, I know somebody. I know somebody from church. It would be a perfect referral for Tanya, but I'm not comfortable having that conversation. And so Tanya needs to help coach them up to where they can create a conversation around senior care, senior placement, dementia, things like that. Yeah. Um, so it's always one of those three things. And we spend a lot of time in the organization really looking at people's referrals. We keep track of referrals. Um, we're, I think we're different than BNI. We don't keep track of closed business, but we keep track of referrals and we want to know who's not getting referrals. And then we want to really dig into, okay, why aren't you giving refer or getting referrals or giving referrals? We'll, we'll we attack both those things um, and try and solve those problems. Mm -hmm. And we find that that's what keeps people coming to the organization and keeps people sticking around the organization. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred. So that's, that, that's our, you know, that's our, that's our, our main focus is just making sure people are effective at asking for referrals. Right. I love that. I really do, because I'm one of them and I'm guilty of that. Um, it's, you know, it's a learning experience. That's why I love my chapter, 
because, you know, when I started, and I'm still, you know, early days where I'm still learning and getting used to the spark between the two of recognizing opportunities. Um, but I have amazing people in my chapter that are helping me and supporting me. Um, like, I mean, I know people and I talk to people and I get so involved in the conversation that you and I are having, Frank, that I completely don't even think about, oh, wait, Frank would be a perfect referral to Randy or Frank would be the perfect referral to Shelby, who are both members of my, you know, my chapter because of this and this and this reason. And I will walk away and I won't, I wouldn't have made that connection. But then when I'm chatting to Shelby or Randy and specifically Randy, because he, he does a lot of mentoring for me. Um, I'll talk to him about people, I don't, you know, who I've spoken to or whatever. And he will say, you know, Frank would actually be a perfect referral for me because of this and this. And I'll sit there and the penny will drop. And I'll be like, oh my gosh, why did I not think of that? Of course. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's, I have to practice that, you know. Well, we all, think- yeah, we all come by it honestly, because it's, you know, we're all looking into the same building, but from a different angle, you yes. know, you might be looking through the east windows and I'm looking through the north windows and we're just seeing the same thing, but from a different angle. Um, and I, I, we experienced that. Well, I'm sure it happens in BNI where you have a member saying, oh, that Tanya, she doesn't like me. She never gives me referrals. She could really help me. And Tanya, that's not the case at all. Tanya does like you, but she doesn't see the world. You see the world. And that's where you just need to have a conversation. And, you know, hey, Tanya, you can really help me. I'd love to meet these people. Um, if you're open to it. And then, like you say, what do you say that the penny drops? I've never heard that expression. Yeah. <laughs> penny <laughs> drops. A, the light comes on, the light bulb. Beep. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the light bulb. Yeah, the penny drop I've never heard. Um, but that happens. And but that's where the communication comes in. And I, and I think part of the problem, well, a big problem is is that, well, I, you know, I'll pick on you, Shereen. You're a bookkeeper, you're a QuickBooks expert. All right. There aren't a lot of people who understand debits and credits and how that all works. Um, And you do, and you have a mountain of education, a mountain of training, a mountain of experiences, and it's all in your brain. And you go into a meeting and in 60 seconds, you have to convey that to people so they can understand it. And that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, you know, what I tell members all the time is, is that you need to devote, you can't, you can't think about it two seconds before you're going to speak. You need to think through it ahead of time. And, okay, this is what I'm going to say. And it's got to be very organized and it's got to be very mechanical. Um, And then have people who are willing to be, here's the other problem I see is, is that, I joke about this all the time. People are really nice all around the world. I find people are really, really nice. And that's great. I love it. But here's the bad thing is that people are really nice and they will never tell you. I don't get it. I don't understand. They'll look at you and I can, you know, when I was an attorney, I would talk to people and I would be, you know, talking uh, whatever, you know, I'd throw a legal term or Latin or whatever, and they're just shaking their head and smiling. And I'm like, okay, they really... they must think I'm smart and they get it and they don't. Uh-huh. They just walk away saying, I don't know what the hell he's saying. <laughs> um, so those are the things that we really work on in the organization. I love that. Yeah, absolutely love that. Thanks, Frank. Since we're on the topic, did entrepreneurship come naturally for you? Or was it something that you had to nurture? Like I just admitted that when it comes to networking, it's something that I have to nurture. Um, but with entrepreneurship and business owning, is that something that came naturally to you or is it something that you had to nurture, Frank? And then we'll move on to you, Tanya. Um, you know, it was, it, I think it came naturally to me. I remember growing up in Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula, walking, you know, walking on the side of the highway. Uh, Michigan is unique in that bottles and cans are returnable for money. 
So you can walk on the highway and you can pick up bottles and cans and it's, you know, it's 10 cents a piece. Um, you know, and that's not really a business per se, but it is certainly an income opportunity. Um, and then at one point, I was probably fifth or sixth grade. I started, uh, we're living in kind of a, a touristy area, um, selling night crawlers to fishermen. So we go to the golf course at night after a rain and, you know, giant worms, they're coming up and you just pick them and, and then sell them. So um, we'd pick berries and make my mom would make jam and sell my jam to the store. So, yeah, it's just there were little things like that. The notion that you are in control of what you make has always been very appealing to me. Right. Right. Um, can I just confirm something? A night crawler, is that a worm? Yes. It's a very big worm. <laughs> That's awesome. And I'll send you one. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> And Sonia, what about yourself? Did you have to nurture or did it come naturally to you to be an entrepreneur? I am not an entrepreneur. It, that is not my wheelhouse. I am as far removed from that. No, I'm, I'm very purpose driven. That's, that's my, um, so I've always worked for others. I've never had a desire to quote unquote own my own business or um, when I was you know even at the funeral home people would say like why don't you go open your own that just that's just not in in the radar just not in my development mm -hmm. um so even even with you know senior placement like quote unquote you know yes you know I can run the business how I want but I still default to Arnie Cowan as, as the owner. He's the owner of the company. So mm -hmm. I'm very purpose-driven. I love to help people. Um, so if somebody needs help in whatever capacity, but I just am not that person to have my own you know, business or, and it's funny, I don't know why, like, um, it's, I think it's because I'm purpose driven. So if, if my purpose is to help others, then it's more motivating for me to do good. So, right. um, you know, in my different jobs over the years, um, if somebody needed help, I'm, I'm, I'm there. That's what I do. Um, so that's, that's my take. Well, this podcast has got people from all over the world coming with all different types of um, careers and I love it and I it's so nice to meet so many different people um, with different perspectives so thank you Tanya um Frank I know you wrote a book called foundational networking can you tell us a little bit more about that book yeah um you know as I've indicated I kind of went from being this big time a consultant to an attorney to kind of running a networking organization. And so, you know, I originally bought the networking organization as an investment. Um, but as I started to try to make that investment work, right, I'm like, okay, I have to become an expert, I have to really learn this. And so I really started looking at people out there. And I realized that there were, there were people who there, there are a lot of great books out there that talk about networking and they're very tactical. And I saw people out there that were really good with the tactics, but they really struggled getting the results. And then I saw other people who their tactics were horrible, but they did a really good job of getting things from their network. And so I started to kind of examine it very unscientifically. And I realized that the difference between the people um, was and those are you know those are two extremes you have people in the middle who are good at both but with the two extremes you look at it and it's the people who had great tactics and were struggling didn't have those foundational elements they they didn't have the know like and trust they mm -hmm. didn't have the ability to um you know they, they weren't generous they weren't trustworthy and if you don't have though that foundation it doesn't matter how good your commercial is. It doesn't matter how good your handshake is. It doesn't matter how good your product is. People aren't going to refer you. People aren't going to want to associate with you. And so I just felt like if I was going to write a book, I needed to really approach, uh, approach it from that standpoint right. of, you know, build the foundation and the rest will come. You know, having a good commercial is important, yeah. but foundation is what's primarily important to begin with 
Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so this is a question for both you. Where do you see yourself in 10 years and what are you doing to get yourselves there? Tanya? I have learned <laughs> very um, the, the challenge to live in the moment, okay? Because my mom used to even say, even as a kid in an amusement park on the top of the Ferris wheel, right? Where you're, you know, like, you know, beautiful views, you know, from high above. And my thought process was, oh, I want to go on that ride. And I want to go on that ride. And once I get down, you know, when I get off of this one, and I was always, I had always lived my life from a very young girl for the next thing, for the next thing, for the next thing. What am I doing tomorrow? What am I doing on the weekend? Where am I going to go on vacation? So in the future. So to answer your question, Shireen, <clears throat> I live my life as that my journey is my destination. Right. So I don't have any goals other than right now. So even if you were to ask me, well, what's my day look like? How do I, how am I going to, I'm going to get off this call. What am I going to do? I don't know. I have, if I'm not physically like in a working or having classes or networking, I just do what I want to do. So <laughs> it's a fascinating way for even me to speak these words because I have always been goal oriented, always had the next job, the next degree, the next thing, this, you know, where are we going in Christmas, where you're going on vacation, where you're going for, and I don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So I have no expectations for next week, next month, next year, five years. So wherever I am needed, I'm trusting in the universe will put me in the right place to be at the right place at the right time to help whoever I can help in the moment. That sounds fantastic. So are you coming with me to Lake Tahoe, hey, Tanya? Winkle. We'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and what about yourself, Frank? You know, uh, um, I love what I do. Ten years from now, I still want to be doing it. And, um, you know, as far as goals, you know, I, 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 you know, you there are certain things you can control and certain things you can't control. And I think the pandemic has taught us that. Um, and people will say, you know, people would have said, well, you know, the pandemic is is horrible for a business that's built on face to face meetings. And then we learned Zoom. Right. I would not I wouldn't know Tanya. I wouldn't know you, Shireen, if it weren't for the global pandemic and getting on Zoom and just saying I need to meet people. No. Um so I'm really, you know, and, and, you know, there's coaches and consultants that are out there like, you need to have a goal, you need blah, 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 it needs to, you know, be clear and convincing, you know, yeah. it's, it's hard, because you don't know. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who have started networking groups, you know, because it's an easy thing to do. Yeah. I don't know how that lasts. Um, but I know I want to continue to be doing and serving people and creating content and just you know, helping people become more effective, not just in my organization. I work with a lot of organizations, not for profits and things like that, um, mm -hmm. and just continue to be more effective. Um, I guess to borrow Tanya's word, be an inspiration. Yes. Um, yes. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, we've already spoken about the nature versus nurture and, um, as a business owner and entrepreneur, or, you know, we're constantly giving, you know, we're giving, 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 and we need to take that time to refill our tanks uh, so that we don't start giving from an empty tank. So, you know, Frank, what are some of those things that you do to do, you know, to refill that tank? Um, I'm, I'm not a big vacation person. Um, you know, the, the last time I got away, other than to visit family, was, uh, I guess, I came down to Miami. I saw Tanya. Uh, I came down, my son lives down there. So, I, um, but, you know, I I like to go to the movies. Uh, the pandemic really kind of messed me up a little bit because I would, uh, um, I made a point of four times a month going to the movies and I would keep track of it, just like people keep track of you know, how many miles they run or, you know, how many cold calls they make. Wow. And the reason, reason for that is, is when I go to the movies, 
Um, you know, I wear a, you know, I wear an eye watch or a Fitbit of, you know, um, when I go to the movies, my blood pressure gets really low. My heartbeat gets real. I get really relaxed. And so I just find that that's just kind of a, a, a great way for me to reboot. Um, and so my goal was always to get to the movies four times a month. Usually it was more than that. You know, um, I would tell my assistant I'm going on vacation and that's code. I'm going to be leaving the office for about two hours. I'm going to the movies. I will be back. So in the middle of the day, I'll just go to the movies. Um, that so that's, sense. that's really, you know, things like that. <laughs> that's so simplistic and I absolutely love it, Frank. What about yourself, Tanya? Well, Frank, that's fascinating. You and I have to have a conversation because I probably have seen maybe 10 movies in my whole life. Wow. <laughs> and I don't have a TV either. And I, I, know. I don't know what Netflix is. People talk about Netflix and stuff. And yeah, I'm fascinated because I, if you and I made a list of how many movies I've seen, it's probably not more than 10. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For me, um, so... Again, living in the moment has, that's probably one of my biggest challenges, learning to live in the moment. That, that, was, that was a challenge. Um, so for me, with a very previously busy, busy mind, very busy, always busy. The next thing, mm -hmm. what's, what am I doing? A hundred thoughts. What did they, what did you say, Shereen, at the beginning? Uh, how many? Yeah, 6,000 like, thoughts. Yeah, I was probably at, like triple that. Okay. You do the math. Okay. <laughs> just uh, nonstop, nonstop, um, you know, just you know, thoughts, perseverating thoughts. For me, what has grounded me beyond grounding was the practice and art of meditation. I could not keep my brain quiet for 60 seconds when I started. And that is the truth. I would set my meditation timer for 60 seconds, one minute, okay? And my eye, <laughs> like literally 20 seconds in, opening up, 30 seconds in, I'm like, this is impossible. There is absolutely no way I am going to get the hang of it. Right. And then something happened. I, I think it was, I heard and read somewhere that the practice of meditation is its opposite of working out. So it's opposite of physical. So when you go into a gym and you do work, so this was the opposite of that. However, if you're not used to working out or you're not used to running or whatever people do, you just can't go run a marathon, right? You don't go from zero to a hundred. Yes. Or if you're not worked to going into a gym to do a 30 or 45 minute workout is going to be a lot. It's like, if you're not used to walking, you know, whatever the, what's the American goal, 10,000 steps, I think it is, I don't know, whatever that is, you know, yeah. if you're not used to doing it, going from no steps to 10,000 is a lot. So I really took a step back and realized, well, this meditation practice, when I hear people go on retreats for meditation and they're silent and I'm thinking, if I can't do this for one minute, this is like, there's like a big disconnect. So I started slow, very, very slow. And I did a minute meditation probably for a few weeks, like, and that's, and I couldn't do more. And then I got up to two minutes and three minutes. And this is over time. This is not like a, and I'm usually the quick fix one. You know, I'm like, make it happen. You know, that's me. I'm like, just make it happen. So right. this was like a wow, because it was something that, and you don't see, and, and I'm another, you know, we have, well, previously the immediate gratification, right? So meditation is not an immediate gratification, but it takes a while. So I've learned and I do my due diligence to practice the art of meditation at least 25 minutes a day. Sometimes I'll do 25 minutes in the morning, 25 in the afternoon. If I'm completely off, I can even do more. But for me, it has been a wow. The literally the way I could describe it, if, if, if either, if neither of you meditate is it's a it, thoughts and it's like, tr it's almost like um, crystal clear thoughts. Yes. So instead of thinking it through or making a list or the pros and the cons and the to-do list and the outlines, I remember I had a, a high school teacher, I mean, a grammar school teacher in the sixth grade, and she was trying to get us to learn content and she would do the outline. Well, to this day, I don't understand an outline. It doesn't make any sense to me. My brain doesn't work that way. So I would not do well in that class because I was so worried about the outline. Yeah. So for me to take that practice now to say, 
instead of being busy and to do and goals and you know short term long term and daily goals like no 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 i don't need to do any of that if i if i start spinning like i was i was mentioning earlier to where what do i want to do next that is my cue i better just go meditate and even if it's just to restart myself for 5 minutes 10 minutes it has been when i tell you transformational it has been transformational agreed mm -hmm. yeah I agree with you, Tanya. Same for me. Uh, I'm a little bit of a combination. I would, I need to get into nature. So, you know, whether it be backpacking, whether it be a day hike, put on my boots, Rolo gets in a little backpack and off we go. And I feel, um, I feel closer to God when I'm in nature. So if I find a little spot somewhere and I can just hear all the different bird sounds I can feel the soft wind caressing my skin. I can breathe. And all this stops. And then I meditate and I breathe and I just enjoy that moment and just being aware of what's going on around me in that very moment. And it's so freeing and it's so relaxing. And you kind of center yourself and find that again. And then... I can go back home or back to wherever I was busy with and um, I'm on a better mind streak. So whether it be the simplistic things in life like Frank, the meditations like Tanya, the combination of being in nature and backpacking and meditating, whatever it is, take that time and make sure that you prioritize to take that time and do that to refill your tank so you don't give from an empty tank. So thank you so much, Frank and Tanya, for sharing that. So we've come to this the part of the podcast where it's either story time or ask a question time. We're going to play a little bit of a game called Agree or Disagree. So I'm going to say a statement. And then if you agree with the statement, put your hand up. If you don't agree with the statement, well, you're going to tell us why you disagree with the statement. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> right. First statement. When people succeed, it's because of hard work. Luck has nothing to do with success. Agree. I agree with that. Okay. So let's... No, no. But, uh, yeah, I was just trying to think through the question. It's all about hard work. Yeah. I agree with that. So, Frank, you agree with that as well, huh? Yeah. All right. So, Tanya, tell us why you disagree with that. I've seen too many instances where sometimes it's not the hard work. Sometimes it's just being at the right place at the right time, um, other circumstances involved. So I don't think it's just necessarily hard work. Um, some people truly, if they live in their gift, they feel like they never work a day in their life um, because it's not quote unquote hard work. So I'm not saying that people can't get there with hard work mm -hmm. and climb the ladder, but I've also seen um, many opportunities and situations that people have had that have been very successful without quote unquote the hard work right right yeah. i agree with that i agree with that i think if for me it's i don't i don't really particularly believe in luck um i believe in purpose so frank is where he is today for a reason and tanya is well, where he is today for a reason yeah, I, I mean, I think there are outliers on everything. It's kind of like, well, you know, people don't live to 110, but there are people who live to 110, but on average, people are living to 80, 85. So I think there are people out there where luck has, you know, they've just been lucky. Um, but for the most part, I really think it comes down to hard work. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. but we can agree to disagree. No, no. And this is what it's all about. So yep. thank you, guys. I love the fact that you're you're here just sharing your opinions and perspectives because we're all welcome here and and you're all loved no matter where you come from you are so welcome to be yourselves it is a safe place here so the next statement is are we doing on time let's do another one okay mm -hmm. pineapple tastes great on pizza Pineapple, pineapple tastes great on pizza. 
<laughs> so for the listeners, everyone put their hands up. We all agree that pineapple is very tasty on pizza. You had me at pizza. Pizza, I just love pizza. I don't. I really love care. pineapple, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't even eat pizza, but I'll do pineapple. Yeah. There's no such thing as bad pizza. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They are, you know, I don't know if you know this, but that is a very controversial statement. People have yeah. massive arguments over whether a pizza should be allowed to have pineapple on it or not. So yeah. my, my response is get the hell out of the way and give me a piece. Right. I don't care. You go, you over there and argue. I'm going to eat. So I think pineapple goes on anything. You Pineapple is like one of my favorite foods. So I'm too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Okay, that was very quick. So let's do another one. What about playing a game is fun only when you win? Mm. Okay, for the listeners, we all disagree with that statement. Let's see. Tanya, tell us why you disagree with that statement. So I, there's, a, I'm very um, specific in like the how, what games I like to play. But I love, I grew up playing Scrabble. So I love the online uh, app, Words with Friends. I, I, that's another thing that I do too, that relaxes me. It's like a mindless. So I just love, I'm out there, you know, as much as I can. And it's just a mindless, whether I win or don't win. I just love the game. I just love putting the words together. Um, so, and it's funny, I'm not a big crossword puzzle person, but um, I love the, that, that game of like Scrabble or that, um, you know, Words with Friends. Also, I just think, you know, with, it's just, fun you know just collaborating and it's as frank said you know it's almost like whoever wins it's not it's not the the winning part it's just the fun and the collaboration so but words with friends yeah if any listeners out there i i'm on there all the time i love it yeah yeah i agree with you frank what about you why do you disagree with that statement yeah you know i just think it's it, it's it's the competing that's the <laughs> fun part it's the challenging yourself and uh um, you can't win all the time and you just have to be, a, you know, you've got to be a gracious loser. Um, right. Got to be a humble winner. You got to be a gracious loser and just move on to the next thing. So yeah. I used to do words with friends. I just got, I spent too much time on there. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It takes time. You can get quite addicted yeah. to it. Yeah, I think uh, I've gotten into strategizing board games. So I like to work together as a team against the board. It's a lot of fun. Uh, one of the games that I've gotten quite into as a Harry Potter fan is the Hogwarts battle. So okay. fantastic hours on end. Love it. So, yeah, I've it's not about movie either, Frank. I've never seen Harry Potter. or I've never seen a one. I, that's a movie I've never seen. <laughs> OK, OK. I don't feel so bad then. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, it's a grown adult that's a Harry Potter fan. What can I say? <laughs> awesome. Okay, guys, we have come to the end of the podcast. So I just want to take some time. If Frank, can you just tell everyone that's listening where they can find you if they want to reach out? Yeah, the best place to get a hold of me uh, is I have a website, frankagan.com, has all my books listed, has my podcast. LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, email, people like to communicate different ways. Um, that's the best place to kind of reach out and find me. Right. Thank you. Uh, you can get your books on Amazon as well. Or was it just from Amazon? Uh, you, you, you can get them on Amazon. Okay, great. I'm going to figure out how I'm going to send you. You're coming to the States. I'm going to, I'll, I'll send one to Tanya to give to you. Right, so, please. Oh, yeah, that Tanya, would be lovely. You, you have a copy, right, Tanya? I send yes, you a copy. I do. Yes, I do. Okay. Yes. So I'll, I'll get with Tanya. I'll get an address. And uh, um, so. yeah, Tanya, what about you? Where can people find you if they want to reach out to you? So I live on LinkedIn. <laughs> That's like my address. Um, I'm on LinkedIn quite frequently, probably as much as I play words with friends. Um, otherwise, you know what? My cell phone number is the absolute best. Um, it's area code 941-387-6485 easiest way to get a hold of me um, but LinkedIn for anything related to how I can you know help anyone or help them serve their purpose for any and any of my wheelhouses so be love more than happy it. love it awesome and for everybody you can go to friends from wild places website which is friends from wild places .buzzsprout .com. 
that is friendsfromwildplaces.buzzsprout.com where you can download any of the podcasts editions there or you can download it from any and I say any of the music and podcasts downloading apps so Go out there, you know, I also have a YouTube channel for Friends from Wild Places. Go like, comment and subscribe. If you want to find me on Twitter and let me know what you think about the show, please do. You find Friends from Wild Places on Twitter as well. Uh, But other than that, do all the things, share it with your family and thanks for listening and we'll see you next time, guys. And remember, you got this and stay wild. Thank you. Bye. You've been listening to Friends from Wild Places with Shireen Bueta. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast from the links to catch every episode and unleash your passion.